Welcome to A Cult of Personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. In episode number 208, our friends Guido Mina de Suspira and Jocelyn Godwin return to the show to discuss their recent book, Forbidden Fruits, an occult novel. I want to take a moment to explain why it's been more than a few months since the last episode. My father had been ill and he recently passed, so I needed some time to be with my family. So that's what I did. And now it's time to turn back to the task at hand, these illuminating podcast interviews. But I need you to know that I appreciate your patience and understanding while I've been away. Thank you. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners and by the subscribers to chamberofreflection.com, our membership site, who aids us in the cause of informed, authentic, and accessible interviews about Western esotericism. Thank you again. Because of your support, we're able to bring you recordings of this caliber and more to come. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com Now, in episode number 208, an interview with Guido, Mina de Suspiro, and Jocelyn Godwin about their recent book, Forbidden Fruits, an occult novel a follow-up to their previous collaboration, The Forbidden Book. You may recall that Jocelyn was our guest way back in 2012 and Guido in 2015. Forbidden Fruits is a wonderful and intriguing tale, masterfully told and chock full of esoteric themes and insights that you might expect from experts in esoteric research and creative writing. I really enjoyed this novel from Guido and Jocelyn. The way the current events, the esoteric intrigue and a fascinating plot are woven together in a highly entertaining story is brilliant. Furthermore, I really love how Guido, master storyteller, combines his writing with the esoteric knowledge of Jocelyn, one of the most respected academics in this field. I highly recommend Forbidden Fruits. You will not regret partaking in its tempting tale. Guido Mina de Suspira is an award-winning, internationally acclaimed author of many books. And Jocelyn Godwin is a widely recognized authority on the subject of Western esotericism. And I very much appreciate them taking the time to join us today. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Abgerinos, and the outro music is Forbidden by Rob Costello. So I want to welcome Jocelyn Godwin and Guido Mino de Suspira to A Cult of Personality once again. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with both of you, gentlemen. I appreciate you joining me. Thank you. My pleasure, too. The occasion uh, of our interview here is your recently published occult novel entitled Forbidden Fruits from Inner Traditions. Um, This is a really wonderful, engaging, exciting uh, book, I think, and um, a really uh, good sort of follow-up, I guess you could say, to the Forbidden book. Uh, which uh, we had spoken about on the program 
previously, but maybe you could uh, give listeners uh, an idea of what your thoughts were in putting this uh, novel together, um, because uh, there's clearly a lot of uh, thought and intentionality uh, that went into it uh, from my perspective. Well, much as with the Forbidden Book, we try to take a macro phenomenon. In the case of the Forbidden Book was uh, radical Islamic terrorism. And in the case of uh, Forbidden Fruits is the unchecked emigration from uh, Africa to the European continent and particularly to Southern Europe, which means Malta and Sicily, and to a lesser extent Greece, and then create or rather have a problem and deal with this problem in a very esoteric way, because in both novels, the inspectors are not particularly astute. In the first novel, the inspector was terrible. In the second novel, he's not too bad, but he doesn't have enough elements to conduct a proper investigation. And so it's up to these people who are not professional inspectors or investigators, but they have other means at their disposal, by which I mean esoteric means. Because uh, Josley and I were both dissatisfied or rather uh, bothered by the fact that many of these so-called occult novels use secret societies and, and things of that sort as a premise, but then develop the mystery and solve it through rational means, like Sherlock Holmes or something like that. We try to be consistent with the premise and solve it through esoteric means. And I think that that's the difference between the two of us and the rest of the production. That's in a nutshell. I don't know if Jocelyn wants to add anything. Yes, I, th I think probably we actually started with an esoteric interest. But then um, once you have that interest, all these current events uh, are seen through that window and they take on a different aspect from what they take on if you're, you know, if, uh, if you're a complete rationalist. So... Um, in a way, those are the topical hinges of the two books, but then all the other all the other threads come into them, and we, I think um, my interest was in, in in how to weave them together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're quite skillful in the way that you do that weaving. Um, but if you would, uh, you mentioned this sort of uh, difference in perspective based on interest in the esoteric versus what you term the rational. And I wonder if you would mind expanding upon that in relation to, you know, this, this theme of the unchecked immigration and sort of the way that that's impacting culture and uh, society? Well, um, since the book is about Malta, half of the book is set in Malta and the other half in Italy, more or less equally, I am familiar with the problematic in both countries. And the truth of the matter is that there is no way that a country such as Italy, which is not exactly flourishing anyway, can absorb tens of millions of people, not be because it's smaller than California and because its economy is not exactly fantastic. So what happens usually is that when there is this sort of unchecked immigration, um, many of the migrants turn to criminality simply because there's nothing else they can do. I mean, there's just no way of absorbing them all. And um, some uh, politicians have mentioned something such as a Marshall Plan for Africa and for the rest of the poor world so that they could be helped at home and they wouldn't need to cross the Mediterranean and try their fortune, their luck elsewhere, knowing that the chances of doing something good with their lives are, are very slim. However, staying at home may even be worse. So it's a, it's a huge problem. I think it's going to be the problem in the 21st century because... Uh, most of the world is in dire conditions. And now with the internet and with television, etc., these people in uh, underprivileged countries see the type of level of life that 
we have in the Western world, and they want it. And uh, I can't blame them. If I were one of them, I would probably want to do the same. However, the reality is not one of acceptance and, and integration into the society because there are limits, not because of racism or anything, but because the societies they go to are not particularly thriving in the first place. And, uh, you know, there are 60 million people in Italy and the country is smaller than California. And how many more can you put there? You know, and uh, so you see them, you know, going into criminality, not all of them, but because, you know, doing the jobs that other people don't want to do. And, of course, you know, this leaves the door open to human uh, trafficking and organ trafficking and all sorts of horrible things. Because, well, we have a, a, without giving away too much of the plot, you know, we do have a point at the end of the book in which we speak about the undesirables. These people, unfortunately, are called undesirables. And um, and all what that's desired of them are their forbidden fruits, basically. I won't say any more of that. We took an extreme case, but I think that something of this sort is going on already in parts of Europe. And so the situation is dire. And I don't see a solution because... <clears throat> There's a, a part of the political world that wants to impose integration when knowing that integration is impossible because uh, a continent of Europe, like Europe, which is 600 million people, cannot absorb a billion people. So that's the problem. And I think that a lot of people would like to come here. So in, within this context, we have um, developed an extreme case in Malta and then we set out to solve it. That's what we did in the book. Thank you. Yes, we use Malta as a kind of petri dish for the whole problem because it's such a small country, and it's so much on the frontier of this uh, of this immigration. Uh, but of course, uh, it, it, it's um, it's a symbol for the whole problem, mm. for which I see no solution. Uh, I mean, I think the difference. I feel with most people today is that they, they know what the solution is, or they think they do. And they think that if the world adopted their attitude, everything would come right. <laughs> <laughs> and all political parties are posited on this assumption. But um, I don't actually share that. I'm, a, I'm very much a, a pessimist. And I certainly don't think I have the answer. Mm. But I think it's worth putting the problem in front of people, in the hope that something will emerge, and not mm. just um, either solving it with some um, some ideal or extremist um, approach, or just um, just ignoring it, which is easy to do if you're in one of the fortunate countries. Yeah, it's too easy to ignore, and um, I don't. I agree with you. I don't think there's a solution, but I would disagree in saying I don't think that you're pessimist uh, it's just more realist um, mm. but uh, I don't know I, I don't think there are political or economic solutions to this issue at this point right now mm. maybe there will be in the future but um, the the problems of humanity are or never have or will be solved in those ways ultimately. So I appreciate the esoteric perspective that you bring to these questions. Um, and you raised this uh, example of Malta as the sort of Petri dish of this, this issue but Malta is really a fascinating place, and I'm wondering if you could share with me and the listeners uh, some of your knowledge and insights about Malta, its history, its the origins of its culture, and and how that all is uh, relevant to any sort of esoteric considerations. In a way, Malta was a success story because it did absorb 
all these different peoples. And somehow for some hundreds of years, it, um, it blended them. And um, it, it is indeed a, a sort of a multicultural um, entity with immigrants from all over ever since prehistoric times. So um, it seems to have done all right up to a point. And uh, its moment of glory was obviously in the Second World War, where it withstood the bombardments and and um, was a symbol of the whole resistance of, of the Allies. So um, why can't it continue to be that sort of welcoming uh, hybrid civilization? I, I, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure why not, but except it's a very overpopulated island. Maybe it's just that there's no more room there. Yeah. And no more natural resources because it's a, a, almost a waterless island mm -hmm. it's extremely densely populated and it just can't take any more maybe it's just reached reached its limit yes and also from another perspective you can play out the atlantis myth there because of its monuments and all the things you find there that predate the pyramids so very very ancient megaliths, etc., are found in Malta and they raise questions to archaeologists. And that is, in fact, the premise of the book. The Maltese billionaire Sebastian Pinto is sponsoring a search for antique relics. And who's in charge of this is this uh, American archaeologist, uh, Monica, who uh, was rather famous uh, a few years before this time and then her fame faded and sh they do find something from the bottom of the sea and they bring it up to the surface which is very intriguing in the shape of a golden pomegranate and but then in itself it doesn't seem to be so important but then they go to a lab they open it up etc etc many things come out but certainly we chose Malta for two reasons one is the fact that you kind of play out the Atlantis myth there because it's a very, very ancient civilization with incredible um, artifacts that can be found still to this day on the island. And the other one is because it's kind of at the epicenter of the migration phenomenon being so close to Africa, North Africa. So I th we thought it was ideal. Plus there are the Knights of Malta. Um, there was a lot that we could play on and we did. And then, of course, the Knights of Malta gave us the, con the connection with Rome because <clears throat> one more of the capitals of the Knights of Malta is in two places in Rome, which happen to be places in which you can only enter with a passport. <laughs> so, <laughs> the kind of, and, um, and then we develop it from there. And Rome, of course, is, you know, a host of all sorts of different ancient things. But we just thought it was the ideal place to set it in. And... Um, uh, According to the reactions we've had so far to the book, it seems to have worked with readers. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't agree anymore with that. It's absolutely amazing. I think um, definitely the right choice. I really appreciated all of those themes that you brought forth um, from the megalithic ruins, you know, collect connecting it to Atlantis. Uh, it's just super, super intriguing, I think, to anyone who's even taken the time to look at some of the photographs of these things. Um, and then you're right, uh, the history, this sort of eclectic culture and connection with the sea and all that that entails uh, and then, you know, the Knights of Malta, of course, you know, this, this idea of this chivalric order, uh, uh, and in some ways secret society that, um, continues to this day, you know, stretching into some of the, what we consider the, uh, the seats of both worldly and religious power. Mm -hmm. So I, I really, really enjoyed the way that you 
drew upon all of those things. Uh, it's just great. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, Malta is a real gift for that because it 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 has ramifications to all those places and all those movements. And the Knights of Malta, yes, the connection with Rome, secret societies. Um, of course, uh, what we say about them is pure fantasy. Uh, neither of us know a single thing about the Knights of Malta. But we, just, <laughs> we just imagine uh, imagine this. Um, well, I've met a, a few. I've met a few. You've met a few, <laughs> yes. Well, then with apologies to them. <laughs> yes. Um, also, another theme, I think, is the one of the entheogens, which I remember um, distinctly, Jocelyn, uh, then we, when we wrote the Forbidden Book, you said we should not have any external elements, any drugs, so to speak. The thing must be, uh, all the magic must happen uh, without any sort of external aid. And in this one, we did the opposite. We used entheogens, which are assumed you know, by the participants in magic. And um, because we just thought that the Kikion of the Elysium Mysteries would be a, a nice one to revive. And then, you know, something else about the, the Eucharist, going back to pre-ecclesiastical Christianity and trying to, to get to the very root of the secret of the Eucharist. And again, I don't want to give too much away because it's little spoilers for the readers. But one thing I can say is, <clears throat> is that I was raised as a Catholic, and I remember going to catechism, and, um, uh, well, one very important thing was the preparation for the Holy Communion, the Eucharist. And um, when uh, the priest decided that we should have experience with the, the Holy Host, he gave us the very little thin wafer, the very one that will be used, you know, in the occasion of the First Communion. And he made us take it and said, you know, don't worry, this is not consecrated, so it's just a wafer. This is not the Holy Host. But I want you to have the experience, so when, once you get the real one, you know what to expect, except that one is going to be consecrated, which was a very strange thing to do. But anyway, we did it. We put it in our mouth, etc., and it tasted like nothing, insipid, little thin wafer. And then... Months later, the, the actual First Communion came, and we were all dressed to kill, and, you know, blah, 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 big church and flowers, etc. And we went through, and I was saying to myself, oh, oh well, now this is going to be it. This is going to be the experience. Heaven knows what to expect, right? Mm -hmm. And so we went, we kneeled by the altar, and the praise came around, and, you know, incense and music and this and that. And I got the, the, the First Communion, the, 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 the Holy Host. And it was just like the first time. It was a thin wafer. <laughs> and insipid. There was absolutely nothing happening. I thought I was going to be flying or something. And, uh, and nothing happened. So, well, we give a hint in this book of what, in fact, probably the, the Holy Host used to be. And that something would happen to the participants. But certainly not what it has. Because, so I think you can retrace. I mean, there's a lot of fanfare nowadays about the, the Holy Eucharist and the wine and especially the Holy Host, etc., because they try to recreate a very important moment of the ritual, which, however, it's only, you know, it's none of the substance of it because there is no entheogenic um, trip taken. It's just a thin wafer. And, um, well, I think that we sort of go back to the origins of the Eucharist in our book, and we tend to explain what it was all about, and I hope we succeed. Uh, we're not certain of anything, of course. This is always speculation on our side, but we've been pretty convinced by reading books by certain scholars that they may be onto something, and just we thought we would um, spread that. It's like our use of the, the new archaeology. We're not convinced by uh, the, the, the speculations about prehistoric civilization, but they're so exciting and so fruitful and so, uh, so alluring as an alternative to the boring, materialistic, uh, scientific view that we, we think they're perfect for fiction. And the same with the, the theories of entheogens. Um, how can we say whether those speculations are right or not? But it's such a terrific story. One, <laughs> one hopes it's true. Yes, I, I do. I think, 
I mean, there's a good case for it because the whole explanation I just gave you about the, the Holy Host, how could it be all that preparation for it, preparing, for some, preparing to fly mm. in a <laughs> sense, and then you don't? It, mm. it just doesn't make any sense. I, I have a feeling that in origin it was something much more impressive and important. Than, and also, uh, was thinking about what we were saying, we live in a, in a culture ever since the end of the Second World War, which is permeated by Marxism and Darwinism. And um, um, the idea is that, for example, when I was studying um, history uh, in high school in Italy, uh, the professor uh, teaching history was the same teaching philosophy. And she began with prehistory. And she was speaking about market forces in prehistory. I repeat, <laughs> market forces in prehistory. Yeah. And I was there wondering, what markets? Were, were they so second-hand clubs or something? The, the caveman? <laughs> I mean, and, I, and then you know from the start that the whole thing is going to be warped by this Marxism that everything is materialistic and this and that, etc. So we live in this society, you know, in a very materialistic society, and um, which tend to explain away everything. And I think that history as we know it, or rather don't know it, is far more interesting than we've been taught. Far more interesting. And there are, I mean, there are monuments all over the world that seem to indicate that that's what it is. But we are not allowed to, to look into that with any uh, serious intent because we're told that, nah, it's all about money, market forces, and power, power struggles, and there's nothing else. That's all there is in the world. Very sad. And, um, you know, the thing about Josling and I is that unlike our colleague and friend Graham Hancock, whose books I read with joy, I devour his books, so I'm not criticizing him in any way. I, I think he writes great books. But he starts with a theory, and he goes through 500, 600 pages, and in the end, he wants to prove that theory. He wants you to get on board. He wants you to, be a, to become a believer. I think Jocelyn and I, we're not particularly believers in anything. We just like different scenarios than the ones that are presented routinely to us. And so we expose people to these possibilities, and then it's up to them to decide whether or not they want to be believers. Would you say that that's what we do, Jocelyn? Yes, I think so. That's, um, now, I having think, said that, we, we are, yeah. I adore Graham Hancock, and I think I can speak for Jocelyn, too. I love his books. I would recommend oh, yes. them. I recommend them all the time. So, but he does tend to prove theories. He comes, uh, he starts with a, an hypothesis. It becomes a theory. He proves it. He disproves other things against it. And in the end, you become convinced. You become a follower. And that's why they probably work ve very well, too, because it's, it's almost like a novel. You know, he, he's very good at writing novels, too. Yeah. But but we tend to, to keep the field more open and we say, well, it could be this and it could be that. But, you know, if you ask me exactly what I, I believe, I don't know. I'm open. We are surveyors in a sense. Mm -hmm. We tend to know more than your normal materialistic people. So we have more interesting theories to put forth, I suppose. <clears throat> I used Hancock's books for years in teaching a course in first a course in Atlantis and then a course in Rejected Knowledge. And uh, the purpose of them was simply to open students' minds to things that they were not getting elsewhere in their education. Mm -hmm. And Hancock was magnificent for that, his big book. Just whether or not you follow the conclusions, it just um, opens such vistas of time and space that most, American, uh, most Americans are quite ignorant of. Yes, I agree. Well, I certainly appreciate your uh, openness and wanting to explore these ideas uh, that are really central to religion and spirituality. And I applaud you for your interest and, you know, desire to know, because that is a pure... Uh, virtuous uh, impulse. Um, I don't dis necessarily disagree with the assertion or argument that um, entheogens are 
central to mystical religious experience because I think that they do bring about that inherently. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would also say in being open to possibilities that how would I put this? Um, one can only know the true bliss and exaltation of disciplined spiritual practice and meditation that brings about states that far eclipse any possible substance that one might ingest is I guess the best way I could put it. I know this is true from my own experience. So I know it's true in general. Not everyone has that experience. It may be uncommon, but it is possible. And so I, my, I would just argue that it doesn't necessarily have to be an entheogenic only solution to the issue. Um, but that might be for people who are not engaged in rigorous, disciplined, daily meditation practice. Um, so, and, and this is of a certain style of meditation practice as well that would bring about this sort of state. And the other thing that it, it makes me think of is that the entheogenic solution to this question is inherently materialistic, in my opinion. Now, that, I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong or it's not accurate or factually correct. It very well could be and is likely to be. Um, but it is like like when we look at modern culture and its materialism and nihilism to, to answer this question of what lies at the heart of religious and mystical experience is a substance that we have to ingest from without Mm -hmm. is to me completely materialistic and nihilistic because I know it is not completely necessary or required to have that experience. So I find that really interesting in a way because it's like a, a weird sort of paradoxical juxtaposition in mm-hmm. a sense. But um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are. I'm not trying to convince you or expect anyone to agree with me. I just, I'm curious because my own experience and things I've been taught uh don't disagree with it this but it it just opens it to like a much broader sort of possibility of how all of these things can occur yeah um i i, I wouldn't touch an entheogen uh, <laughs> I, I, I i'd be afraid of having a, a phony mystical experience um, because i'm right. sure that i'm sure as you are that um there's, there's a real difference between what those provide and the, and the real thing. Yes. Um, well, in, in the Forbidden Book, we decided to avoid them altogether. And if you remember, there is the protagonist who resorts to the spiritual exercises of Ignacio de Loyola, because he's a Jesuit. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are, of course, from the Sufis to the Buddhists to even the, the Christian mystics, they're all different ways of uh, meditating and, and getting to a certain state without anything from um, external sources. However, it's also true the shamans are in very uh, mystical people and they spend their life differently from the rest of us, but they also do take in uh, entheogens from time to time. So it can, it can be... I just think that the idea that somebody can say, I'm going to take that mushroom cap and I'm going to see God, that is childish. Um, but when you think about the Ulysian mysteries as well as the the mass, the Christian mass, you have to think about a lot of people who may not be 
mystically inclined may not be able to meditate and reach certain states of consciousness on their own. And yet you want to have a mass phenomenon, so to speak, at mass, precisely. And so you distribute these things that give them a hint of what is out there, which can be reached differently. I think that for the initiate, the entheogen is probably redundant, but most people are not initiates. And so that's why, you know, you had the Elysium Mysteries and you had Mass and you had all these other sort of rituals that mimicked um, a superior state of consciousness reached by the true mystic without any entheogens. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I would not disagree with anything you just said. Oh, good. <laughs> Do I get a prize? <laughs> <laughs> no, just that, I, I think that sounds accurate to me. But I think yeah. they, were, they were very different in ancient times where people's whole worldview was so different from today's that they could be integrated into it. Whereas today, uh, given the everybody's worldview, just about everybody's worldview today, in which the material cosmos includes everything, including human consciousness, and religion is if anywhere it's put in a separate box and the two things are not well integrated at all, mm -hmm. I think the antigen is much more often um, either just recreation, as with students taking mushrooms, or else it's, um, I think it, it, it leads to delusions. To, as I said, a, a phony mystical experience. Mm -hmm. And you have, to, you have to look at its results. Does it really transform the personality? Does, it, does the person uh, become, do they radiate the, what you expect to see from a sage? I think the answer is definitely no. No. In any case I've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, me it's, too. It's, um, it's sort of a shortcut and it doesn't really work anyway. Usually shortcuts are long cuts anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but that is the it is still fascinating because so many ancient cultures use them. But it's also true what Justin is saying. Absolutely, even the ancient Romans, which today are are presented for reasons I don't understand as pragmatic Nazis, <laughs> but even the ancient Romans were very spiritual people. Oh, they had the, superstitious to the last degree. Yeah. Yes, they had the lares and the penati in their homes, and they, you know, the, there was the holy fig tree in Rome that has to be. I mean, they were extreme, and you know, the augurs and all of that. They wouldn't do one thing without consulting. You know, they wouldn't go to battle without consulting the augurs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, it was a different uh, type of of life, you know, and um, and then Christianity happened, I suppose, and um, something very strange happened. Um, the religiosity of life was supplanted by the religiosity of the afterlife. Life was no longer a religious experience. It was all about the afterlife because life was horrible. So after death, you'd be so great if you behave nicely. It's the strangest thing that happened to the Western world. It really is the greatest revolution of all of them. Because, Are you talking about the Reformation now? No, I'm talking about Christianity in general, when ecclesiastical Christianity. Um, it supplanted a very vigorous uh, mythology, the Greek or Roman mythology, which accounted for just about everything in a very colorful way. Mm -hmm. And people lived vibrantly then in the now. Um, they didn't live eternally. Only warriors went to the Elysian fields. But most people, that was it. Life was all they had. There was no hope for eternal life. And then came from another continent, this religion that promised eternal life to everyone. And in fact said, don't really concentrate on life now because it's not really worth living. Just behave virtuously and you'll go to heaven. It's the strangest thing. It's the biggest, greatest revolution that happened in uh, in the history of, man, of humankind. And um, I don't know, including the, the Norse mythology, Valhalla, only the warriors went there. They have a similar uh, idea that the Greek or Roman mythology had. You know, So life eternal was a, for a very few who died in battle, etc. And, um, and then this thing came, 
and life was no longer worth living because it was suffering anyway. So just concentrate on the afterlife. And, um, you know, I think that a lot of people are unhappy with this and were unhappy with this. And that's why they've been sold all these, these um, developments outside of religion, trying to account for things. And we've seen a whole variety of them. And one of them is the entheogens, because, you know, some people have these experiences, including Graham Hancock, you know, who wrote a whole book about them, including Terence McKenna, of course. Um, and they think that they're getting very close to the whole mystery. I don't know if it's true, but it's, it certainly makes for good reading. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. enjoy reading these things and I can travel vicariously with them without risking anything. Well, yeah. Also, yeah. also, our characters use them in, in extremis, don't they? Yes. You, they, would, you, you wouldn't want to be in the position of our characters when they're using them. Not at all, no. Right. It's, it's, a, it's an absolute last resort in it's a horrendous a last re- situation. It's a last resort, and, and they rely on them in, a, in order to save themselves and to save many other people. Yes. But they're not doing it recreationally at all. And, and, and I want to think that Raphael is a, a serious student because he has a, a mentor in alchemy. And, uh, however, he has to precipitate all of these studies because of the contingencies they find themselves in. They are basically being chased by assassins. They don't know who they are or why they're being chased. And, uh, and why do they want them dead? And so the whole book is about run for your life, really, until they realize why, and they kind of solve the mystery, but it's too late. But then it's not too late. The reader will know. <laughs> we can't say really much more than that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is it's really fascinating to read about. And um, I don't necessarily disagree that these experiences, if engaged with intentionally, can can bring one closer to the numinous or ineffable, but only really in the sense that it kind of like excuse my language kind of like fucks the body mind so much that you kind of like get a glimpse of the the of a greater possibility of reality that um it's a shock because it's all at once and then um it sort of opens you up to the possibility of this is all such a much greater mystery than we could ever possibly even appreciate, mm-hmm. let alone perceive. And that in and it of itself is a great blessing. Yes. Yes. So from that perspective, I I'd see, can certainly see how uh, a mass or a, a ancient Greek mysteries would employ these sorts of things in this manner. And, and yeah, wh- why not? Because it certainly can, can produce that sort of um, wonder and awe that only the divine is capable of producing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, as you were saying before, not, I don't think everybody can have this uh, vision of the numinous or the ineffable or the divine. I think a few people can, you know, um, but there are other people who may like to have at least a glimpse. And for them, these experiences are worthy, I think, but not for the serious seeker. I think the serious seeker can get there differently and permanently if he's really an enlightened seeker. So, but that's not the case of what happens in this book. They are resorting to this as, as, a, as Jocelyn said, as a last resort, and it works for them. So, good for them. But um, there is that possibility, and we, we also really enjoy the fact that we avoided this completely in the first novel. In the second novel, we used it on the contrary very much to great effect yeah so we just wanted to do that we enjoy that yeah it was enjoyable i have to say and 
And I have to also say, I think there, you know, you are probably onto something in terms of the way that um, the, you know, the tradition of alchemy, uh, in the way it, you know, laboratory alchemy producing substances which are then ingested to alter one's body mind, uh, it certainly seems like a continuation or origin or somehow connected to all of this. I mean, that, that seems undeniable, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Yes. Yes. Could you say more about that? Well, alchemy is so puzzling because one, <clears throat> it, one doesn't know exactly what they were doing in the lab and how that related to <clears throat> what they were doing in their minds. You know, in Jungian alchemy, it all happens in the, in the soul. And uh, whatever happens in the lab is just uh, experienced as a projection. Or in the alchemy of Ulysses Evola, it's all manipulation of the parts of the, uh, of the soul and the elements of the personality. But I think <coughs> it's impossible to understand alchemy unless you've done laboratory work, which I haven't done, which is why I don't really understand it. But I know a, a, a couple of people who have, and that's enough to convince me that one of the, the important thing about it is that it unites the material and the immaterial, and that manipulations on one plane have results on the other. And to take it all into the psychological domain misses the point of that. Yes, I think that Jung did very well to bring back alchemy at a time in which it was completely forgotten and at the height of positivism and materialism, so kudos for that, but he didn't engage in any lab work. And to make it even worse, he didn't know any Latin. (laughs) (laughs) So Marie-Louis von Franz, his disciple, the best of them in my opinion, uh, was the Latinist for him. So his appreciation of, of alchemy was purely intellectual. Um, and as Jocelyn says, we don't really know what happened in those labs, but what's the name of that Scottish guy that you know, Jocelyn? He's an alchemist. Oh, Adam, uh, Adam, Adam McLean, you mean? Right, yes. Yes. Well, I think he's a hands-on alchemist, isn't he? Not, not anymore. Not anymore, uh, okay. No, no, but, um, but anyway, the, these people have tried to... Um, do what the ancient alchemists were doing, and uh, they come to some results. I don't think they they care to spread the results they come to, because no. it becomes like a personal quest. But I think there's more than 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 just psychological interplay or that kind of thing. It's it's we don't really know, as Jocelyn says, but I think they were onto something. It couldn't be otherwise. These people were risking their lives. They were writing cryptic treatises because of the censorship from the church, they had to hide behind symbols because they couldn't straightforwardly say use three grams of this and four grams of that. But um, would they have risked their lives if it had been all for no reason, just a pastime, do well, you think? I, what I would say is that, that, there, that this tradition includes both actual laboratory, for lack of a better term, recipes for producing specific herbal and metallic substances that can then alter one's consciousness or physical form, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. such as it is. Um, But there is also something going on sometimes simultaneously and sometimes not, which is using the laboratory processes as descriptions for the processes occurring within the body-mind of the meditator to Mm -hmm. produce what I would say are, again, like very similar sorts of states because 
these meditative practices, you know, for lack of better terms, you know, produce what you could call bliss, or I think for this audience, a more accurate description would be like a sort of a Gnostic intoxication. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yes, you would definitely want to use language that hid what you were really doing because it would be dangerous to disclose it publicly. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say about it. And I don't think these two things are necessarily exclusive. No. I no. think there are texts where you can find them doing both at the same time, although there's no way I could name one of them at this moment. I don't think there was any need for secrecy in some, some uh, cultures. If you think of Chinese alchemists, mm -hmm. uh, the Taoist alchemy, alchemy, or the Indian ones who still you know, work uh, um, openly with, uh, on, 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 their, on their furnaces, or in the Arab world, um, it didn't have the same com competition with the salvation that was promised by the church. That's um, correct, yeah. Well, you know, the church was this, this as I said before, this uh, great revolution. I don't mean it in a good sense. And um, it kind of put a stop to, I mean, it, it was... You have written a length about the, the pagan dream of the Renaissance, Jocelyn. Mm -hmm. Wonderful book. And they did, they did try to uh, produce a syncretism between Christianity and the pagan past, and somehow successfully sometimes. But the fact is that if the church had not been vigilant, uh, probably, I would think, I would venture to say that in Renaissance Florence, they would have reverted fully to paganism. Yes. Had it not been for Savonarola and people like right, that. Right. And mm -hmm. the Borgias were not Roman, they were from Catalonia, so they didn't have the same <clears throat> appreciation of paganism. But uh, the fact is that this um, imported novelty religion, Christianity, especially what they made of it, um, was very much at odds. It was not endemic. And uh, once they, in, in Italy, they rediscovered the classics, a process that took about 200 years, they realized, that, what do we need Christianity for? I mean, this mm -hmm. is so much better. It accounts for everything. Mm -hmm. Especially if you see gods and goddesses <coughs> and ar as archetypes. Well, yeah. that explains it all. Mm -hmm. But they couldn't do it. So the church was all pervasive, tremendously influential at the time. And uh, it kind of suppressed free thinking for a long time, much as now the, the secular world and the, is suppressing, again, free thinking. And uh, in, you know, it's um, substituting the dogmas that the church used to have with new dogmas of a Darwinian and Marxist uh, origin. Mm -hmm. And we're back, at the same, we're back to square one. You know, people cannot really express their minds. And uh, that is that seems to be a very Western thing to do because, as you were saying before, in in India and other places in the world, there there seem to have been more freedom down the centuries to express certain thoughts. And of course, there were persecutions there too. But we do know that Akbar, for example, in India, achieved a truly multicultural empire where everybody was, you know, Hindus, Muslims, and they all coexisted, and they all could write and say whatever they wanted. So it was possible. And I can't think of a place in Europe that did the same 500 years ago, except maybe Florence, until Savonarola came. And then Savonarola put an end to it all. Even though he was, I mean, I just read <clears throat> Greg put a, on the Occult of Personality Facebook page, you put a, a thing about Giordano Bruno. And well, he's another example. You know, he was, you know, burnt at the stake because. Mm -hmm. He had ideas that differed. I mean, it took a long time. It took 17 years, his trial. And, and in the end, and the sad thing about that is that I've read the trials um, of the, I mean, the transcription of the trials, especially the one between Bellarmino and Bruno. And you come away with the, with the impression that the great mind there is Bellarmino's, not Bruno's. Unfortunately, I hate to say it <laughs> because obviously I lean towards Bruno. But 
those Jesuits who were part of the Inquisition, now Bernalmino, of course, also persecuted Galileo, these were great minds, but they were great minds in a very limited way, in a, how could I put it, in a very materialistic way. They were very clever. They were very clever, but there were no mystics. You understand? So the adversaries of free thinking, especially the type of free thinking we like, were formidable. They, I mean, Roberto Bellarmino and, and his entourage, these were very clever people and very convinced of being the owners of the secret. So it was very difficult for uh, free thoughts to circulate. And it's a pity because heaven knows what we've missed because there were very, very great minds on the other side of the barricade that had to hide, conceal, mimic, you know, camouflage or get caught and burn at a stake. Yeah, there's yeah, a certain, know, certain personality type that can't bear the thought of people thinking or believing differently from itself. And if yeah. it gets in power, then you get a totalitarian system. Yes. In which people, it doesn't like people thinking differently. Um, uh, because, well, I think because it feels insecure. Mm -hmm. I think uh, every dogmatist... Uh, is insecure. That's why they had to be dogmatic to, to prop up their own belief. But when they get into power, uh, then that's the time when children have to recite uh, their loyalty to whatever, uh, to, to the state or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, any sort of deviance is, is noticed by the neighbors and reported to the authorities. Yep. And um, it's... Um, if religion gets into the mix, then you have a very sinister uh, situation. Yes, and with Marxism, you could say that there was a new religion supplanting the old religion, because the moment Marx said, you know, history is not <clears throat> uh, a discipline, but it's a science, and as a scientist, I can make accurate predictions, and therefore I have seen the future, and if you don't believe with what I said, then you're an heretic, you need to be suppressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, about 120 million people perish in the 20th century because of Marxism. I repeat, 120 million. Yeah. We see endless films about the Holocaust, which was horrible. But Hitler killed 20 million people, not 120 million. So that's what happens. The, and, and that's what Marx provided, dogmas. Yeah. And people love him for that, because most people need dogmas desperately, because they're not very intelligent. And once they know that, oh, all I need to do is say da 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 and use some uh, warped Hegelian um, dialectics in order to explain the world and the universe, then I'm, I'm it. I'm done. I'm done thinking. I'm in the know. And those who don't think the way I do, they're wrong and they need to be oppressed. And that's the way, that's what the church used to say once with different dogmas. And then Marx came and he supplanted religion with his own opium of the people, which is Marxism. And, uh, you know, for people who are seekers of the truth with a capital T, goodness, you know, this, <laughs> it's a nightmare because that's not exactly when, when uh, our sort of uh, interests and quests can be pursued freely or encouraged at all. Rarely <clears throat> in historical times do you see uh, governments that encourage these things. I mean, I can think of Rudolf II in, in Prague, for example. I can think of the De Medici in, uh, in Florence, but not so many. Not so many, because... Well, I mean, I, I agree that, you know, suppression and oppression is bad. We don't like it. We don't want to go through it. We don't want to be affected by it. Granted. But I would also argue that um, to serious seekers, it is not an obstacle that can't be overcome. And and we're not talking, in at least in this podcast, to, quote, regular people, unquote. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone listening to this, and certainly anyone who is listening at you know, 57 minutes into the interview <laughs> yes. is um, a serious seeker. And so yes. I would say to 
us as serious seekers that these are not obstacles to your path because all you have to do is throughout history, like you're talking about, look at these times. Um, one that comes to mind prominently is the Spanish Inquisition, mm-hmm. during which we had an absolute flourishing of Jewish Kabbalah. And then we had, because of the forced conversions and expulsions, a flourishing of Christian Kabbalah. And that then became somewhat of a basis for Western esotericism altogether. Yeah. Um, There's other examples, too, that really are prominent in my mind about this sort of thing. And another is Gurdjieff. Uh, He purposely took his students into what I would call uncertain times and places you know, the Russian Revolution or um, Turkey, you know, after World War I, mm-hmm. you know, different areas that were not stable. I mean, even in, you know, studying Pico della Mirandola in Florence, yeah. the Renaissance, yes. like, yes, he was Especially under the care actually. of the Medici, you're right, yeah. he was under the care of Medici, but... During that time, there was tremendous cultural and religious and political instability in Florence that was going on while all of that sort of blossomed and right Mm. before it was put down. So we have the opportunity, I think, to sort of rise above our circumstances. And certainly nobody wants to go through oppression and suppression of speech and having to police what you say and where you say it and who you associate with and yeah the thought you, police yeah George exactly Arwell's thought police, like yeah. we don't we don't want this but we can use it to our advantage mm-hmm. it yes. can it can be used to our advantage so oh i agree with you yes. yeah i i so it is like a, a two-sided coin mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. Yeah, we chose to be here in interesting times. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I do think, however, that the Medici's kind of um, Pico della Miranda, Marsiglio, Ficino, they were sponsored by the Medici. They were into, I mean... Oh, absolutely. Um, protected, yes. yes, and you know, Jocelyn, that um, one of the later Medici's was the sponsor of Bartolomeo Cristofori. And he snatched him away from Padua and made him come to Florence and gave him a whole palace and say, invent something. And he invented the pianoforte. Right. So, so I mean, <laughs> these people, I mean, I wish there were people like them, you know, some, because these were exceptional times in which the government happened to be extremely open and keen and curious about novelties. And all but suppressing. And then, of course, Savonarola came around and, you know, he wasn't anything like the Medici's, and he all reverted back to obscure and these um, uh, adversary times are useful to us because, well, they're a point of reference. Many times, especially lately, whatever the government says, anywhere I go, I'm sure that the opposite is true. (laughs) So so that's very useful because I always know where I'm at, you see. It concentrates the mind wonderfully. That is true. That's how it works. And it and it seems to be getting more and more absurd by the day. Well, of course, now with this pandemic, it, it's a, it's a godsend for a government because they're able to control you in a way that they couldn't before. And it, it reminds me very much of religion. When uh, a bishop would say, well, you cannot do this because of this and because of that. And that was that. And you have, I mean, mm-hmm. they need, see, people, and I know I don't mean the people listening to this program and I don't mean the, the, the seekers, but I mean people in general need some sort of religion, and this religion can be secular. And I think now we have a secular religion, but it's still a religion, meaning uh, a bunch of guidelines on how to behave and how not to behave. And, um, and make sure you behave this way or else this will happen. And so it's, it's new in the sense that they don't appeal to God, they appeal to science but they appeal to their own version of science, which is what Rupert Sheldrake calls the scientific priesthood. 
And that's what scientists are nowadays. So um, that's that's the, the world we live in, but it's not the first time that this happens to seekers. And in a sense, they give you, it's like a, a point of reference to be surrounded by these people because you know exactly what not to engage in. Whatever they tell you to engage in, don't, and vice versa. Well, I think I, we should begin to wrap it up here. I'm mindful of our time, and I appreciate you joining us and spending your uh, afternoon here. Um, and just as sort of like a final wrap-up, I, I was wondering <clears throat> if each of you could share with us some of your insights into how I let's see the best way to put it would be how your chosen discipline and your interest in esotericism sort of connect to uh, produce unique insights like um, and just as an example like uh, studying esoteric subjects academically I came to understand that many of the people who participate in those activities are for a lack of a better term LARPing or pretending. <laughs> um, I didn't know that before I studied this subject academically. So I know that there are things that each of you have learned through your, like Jocelyn, through your academic work, Guido, through your writing and overall study of the world that have affected your understandings of esotericism. And I'm wondering if you could uh, share those with us a little bit. Oh, well, well, for me, it was <clears throat> meetings with two people in the 1960s. When I was a grad student at Cornell, I met Anthony Damiani, who was an astrologer and uh, a most profound student of, of Eastern wisdom, and who made his living taking tickets on the New York Thruway. And he gathered uh, a group around him, whom he instructed in some of these subjects. And through his example, it was clear that this was something one wasn't getting in academia. And then uh, through him, I met Paul Brunton, who wrote many bestsellers in the 1930s and 40s, like The Quest of the Overself and The Wisdom of the Overself and The Search in Secret Egypt and The Search in Secret India. And through Damiani's mediation, I was able to go and visit Brunton in Switzerland several times. And that, um, for me, was the, the key. And everything I've done since then has been in the light of having met those two men. <clears throat> Jocelyn? I think you failed to mention that museum that attracted you very much in Oxford when you were a boy. Oh, well, I could fill in a lot more <laughs> things. Like that, yes. like well, the, tell them about the, the museum, the, because... The, oh, the, the, the Pitt yes. Rivers Museum, you mean? Yes, well, that, had, that was a, 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 a um, ethnological museum that had the, the wonders of the whole world set out there, from the shrunken heads to the totem poles to the torture instruments to the, the pierced skulls and everything. And um, visiting that from probably the age of six onwards, I expect that probably warped me for life. I don't know if warped or inspired you, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean... I, How about you? Do well, you the thing is, I think that both Jocelyn and I have one thing in common, which is... Um, inborn curiosity and I, I was never satisfied with, was, with what I was taught at school I always found it missing even when I didn't have the means to understand why I got the means later in philosophy, in math, etc but I, I felt that there was something missing or that at least I was being presenting a partial view of the whole phenomenon for reasons that I didn't know then but I can say a propaganda in a sense and then I began to study on my own. Uh, very much, I would think, that the beginning was Rainer Maria Rilke, the Austrian poet. And, uh, and there was something there that, that spoke to me, 
which, and then of course Yeats and others, poets who were mystics in our own tradition, but they were mystics. And then I began to read all sorts of things, and I got to two gentlemen who I thought were very interesting. One was uh, Rupert Sheldrake, and the other one was Jocelyn Godwin. And why were they interesting? They were interesting because they had an academic background and they had gone to the quote-unquote right schools, and yet they were writing things that were being considered er heretic by the different, you know, either the scientific community or the humanistic community. And I began to read them and I befriended them both. And then I didn't know I was going to end up writing two novels with Jocelyn, but um, in the meantime, I kept reading outside of the canon. And I realized that uh, our canon is something that has been worked on for the last 2,000 years. If you read the Confessions of Augustine, I was rereading it recently, uh, you realize that even back then, we're speaking about hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they were already working on building a Western canon because the people, he quotes, the philosophers or historians, well, are known to me. So they have come down the canon. And so there's been this, this attempt rather reussi attempt from the Western world to create a canon that we all have to abide by. And then there's a lot of extra-canonical stuff out there that's wonderful, and it goes under the category of rejected knowledge or whatever you want to call it, which is just as fascinating and just as interesting, but is completely overlooked. And, and that what interests me. That is what interests me, and how it, uh, it has uh, affected our society, even though we haven't been told about it. And um, that's been my life study. I mean, I've been studying that for the last 40 years, and uh, I'm happy I did, because it opened up vistas that I never knew would have existed had I not done so. Thank you so much. It has been an absolute delight to speak with both of you again. I can't thank you enough. Your book is Forbidden Fruits, an occult novel, Jocelyn Godwin and Guido Mina de Suspiro. I really appreciate it, and uh, I know the listeners do as well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts in the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks, and I salute you. <laughs>